Hello and welcome to Runkle of the Bailey. My name is Ian Runkle. I'm a Canadian criminal defense and firearms lawyer. Today I want to share a case, not because it's terribly legally important. This one's just entertaining. This came to my attention. It's the case of the Queen and Ronald Byfield. And we see Ronald Byfield was acting in person, so apparently didn't have a, a lawyer for this uh, this appeal here. On appeal from the conviction entered, so he's appealing the conviction and we'll see more about why. The appellant was found guilty of a single count of possession of a narcotic, in this case cocaine, for the purpose of trafficking, contrary to Section 5.2 of the Controlled Drugs and Substances Act. He was sentenced to 24 months imprisonment, less pre-sentence custody, so he would have already spent some time in, in custody before this, and that's counted against his time, and other ancillary orders, which in this case would include a firearm ban. Although he originally appealed both his conviction and sentence, at the hearing of the appeal, he abandoned his appeal against sentence, so the only thing that proceeds is the appeal against the conviction. Police discovered 184 grams of cocaine, which is not a small amount, on the appellant's person when they searched him after stopping the car that he was in. Prior to the trial, the appellant applied to exclude this evidence, alleging violations of Section 8 and 9 of the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms, that's his rights with regards to not being stopped unfairly, and also with regards to searches. So he's saying that the, the stop or the arrest or the detention was bad, and also that the search was improper. The motion judge, who is not the trial judge, dismissed the application. Following this decision, although not pleading guilty, the appellant did not contest his guilt based on admissions made under Section 655 of the Criminal Code. So essentially, he likely admitted that it was his uh, his cocaine, and once the cocaine is going into evidence, there's not a whole lot left to fight about. The appellant challenges his conviction on the basis that the motion judge erred in failing to find that the appellant was arrested in the absence of reasonable and probable grounds, thereby violating his rights under Section 9 of the Charter. Further, the appellant contends that his rights under Section 8 of the Charter were infringed, because he was subjected to an illegal strip search, contrary to the case of the Queen and Golden. If you want me to cover the uh, the Golden case, which is basically the major case on strip searches, let me know in the comments below. The underlying facts can be stated succinctly. Acting on a confidential tip, officers of the Barry Police conducted surveillance on a house from which they suspected an individual known as Tristan was selling drugs. The police saw a vehicle registered to the appellant parked in the driveway of that residence. One of the officers knew of the appellant from a previous drug investigation. The information about Tristan, the house, and the appellant was somewhat dated, having been received about a year before. That's pretty dated, but that's neither here nor there. While the appellant's car was parked in the driveway, a man left the house and got into the passenger seat of the appellant's vehicle. The driver and the passenger soon switched seats before the car was driven to a nearby plaza. Within minutes of this vehicle being parked at a plaza, or at the plaza, a male got out of a green car and got into the appellant's vehicle through the rear driver's side door. After about a minute, this person got out of the appellant's car and returned to the green car. At this point, the officers believed that a drug transaction had just taken place. The police stopped the appellant's car as it was being driven out of the parking lot. The appellant was in the front passenger seat. Both the appellant and the driver were arrested. Just as a bit of a, an aside, uh, people buying and selling on things like Kijiji or Facebook Marketplace may engage in similar transactions. So the meaning of this is becoming less clear in the modern marketplace. However, this is behavior that the police take as indicating a drug transaction. This is how drugs are often uh, exchanged. The arresting officers conducted a pat-down search of the appellant incident to his arrest. Nothing was found. They called dispatch to request that a uniformed officer be sent to transport the appellant to the police station, which was about four minutes away. So he's being taken back to the station. He's going to be booked. After arriving, the dispatch officer performed another pat-down search of the appellant. This was for safety reasons for the officer, the public, and the appellant, as well as to prevent the destruction of evidence. It's very common that they'll do a preliminary search before they take somebody into custody. That's to make sure that they don't have any weapons, that they also make sure that they don't have any instruments of escape, and that they make sure that there's not any evidence that might be lost or other things that shouldn't go to the cells. 
During the search, the officer discovered a large hard object in the appellant's groin region, which he believed was non-anatomical. When the officer asked the appellant what it was, the appellant said, my dick. The officer investigated further, because of course he did. He and another officer rearranged the appellant's clothing and reached into his underwear where they located a package containing 184 grams of cocaine. This is a pretty audacious uh, effort on the part of this guy, because they feel it, they can tell it's not what he's going to claim it is, and but he's trying to keep them from searching further, From so he's telling them essentially, you don't want to go and look at that, but they weren't going to take his word for it. The motion judge found that the police had reasonable grounds to arrest the appellant, pursuant to their powers under section 495 sub 1 sub a of the criminal code. In reaching this conclusion, he considered the confidential tip, applying the test set out in the Queen and Dubot, namely whether the tip was compelling, credible, and corroborated. After reviewing all of the evidence in considerable detail, the motion judge concluded that, in totality, the officers subjectively believed that they had grounds to arrest the occupants of the vehicle, and that their belief was reasonable in the circumstances. You see that there's two parts of this. There's the subjective belief, and there's also this objective part that their belief actually has to be reasonable. So if they believe it for crazy reasons, that's not good enough. In short, the motion judge found that the officers had reasonable grounds to believe that the appellant had committed a drug trafficking offense and could be arrested without a warrant under Section 495 Sub 1 Sub A of the Criminal Code. With the assistance of duty counsel, the appellant submits that the motion judge's analysis of whether there were reasonable grounds was insufficient and failed to properly consider the Debo factors. In particular, the appellant points out that the information received from the confidential tip was stale and from an unproven source. Proven versus unproven essentially means that a proven source is somebody who's provided good information in the past and that we know that they can be relied upon in that fashion. Unproven source means that they haven't really been tested. And the only thing, that you can imagine a step worse, which is something that the police probably wouldn't rely on, which is like a known bad source, somebody who's given them bad information in the past. If they had a known bad source, they're unlikely to rely on it because the court would be inclined to throw out anything they did relying on that. He also asserts that the information relating to the appellant was dated. Year old, that's dated. We see no error in the motion judge's analysis. The motion judge was aware of the shortcomings in the background information in the possession of the police. However, this source of information did not bear the entire load of the reasonable grounds requirement in this case. Prior to making the vehicle stop, the police witnessed what they reasonably believed was a drug transaction. The motion judge properly applied the Queen and Story to this factual matrix and found that the evidence relied upon supplied the reasonable grounds required by Section 495 Sub 1 Sub A. The record supports his conclusion that the arrest was lawful and did not violate Section 9 of the Charter, so his rights weren't violated. The appellant submits that even if the arrest was lawful, he was subjected to an illegal strip search, resulting in a violation of his rights under Section 8 of the Charter. We disagree. It is common ground that the appellant's clothes were not removed and his genitals were not exposed. Both of these are significant things when we're talking about strip searches. The searching officer believed that this mere rearrangement of clothing did not constitute a strip search. He was mistaken. In Golden, at paragraph 47, the majority of the Supreme Court of Canada made it clear almost 30 years ago that the rearrangement of clothing in circumstances similar to this case does constitute a strip search. See also the Queen and Pilon, 2018, Ontario Court of Appeal. Despite this misunderstanding of the searching officer, the motion judge concluded that the search was reasonable. He cited 15 reasons in support of this conclusion, including... The search was conducted in a manner that ensured the health and safety of the appellant. It involved a brief, 15 seconds to a minute, visual inspection of the appellant's underwear area. The searching officer was the same gender as the appellant. The appellant's gender, uh, genitals were never exposed. No articles of clothing were removed. No member of the public witnessed any part of the details of the search because it was concluded between a police cruiser and a large snowbank. So they set up cover so that he'd have some privacy. And there was no evidence to suggest that the search was gratuitously aggressive or humiliating. 
What this means is that if they strip search somebody in order to humiliate them or in order to intimidate them, for instance, if you imagine that they do a strip search and they've got a line of police officers laughing at somebody, that weighs against the evidence from a strip search potentially going in. The evidence demonstrate that, demonstrates that the searching officer's safety concerns were real and that it was appropriate to conduct a second pat-down search. Given his discovery of the unknown object in the appellant's groin area, further investigation was reasonable and necessary. We disagree with the appellant's submission that, because the police station was only four minutes away, the strip search could have waited until then. And when you think about it, what he's asking here is that he essentially wanted to be strip searched at the police station in a situation where his privacy can be better protected. Fair enough, however, that's not determinative. The court is weighing all of these things. The strip search was necessary to ensure the safety of all concerned, as described above, during this journey to the police station, even if that journey was to be brief. If we imagine that he has a knife hidden in there, he could have potentially done some damage if he's sitting in the back of a police car with a knife. We see no error in the motion judge's analysis, nor in his ultimate conclusion that Section 8 of the Charter was not infringed. Although the motion judge found that the appellant's rights under Section 8 and Section 9 of the Charter were not infringed, he conducted a Section 24.2 analysis. And for the, uh, the lay people watching this, 24.2 is... The way our Charter is worked out is that just because your rights are violated doesn't necessarily mean that the evidence won't go in. Once the court finds that your rights are violated... Then they conduct an analysis under either Section 24.1, which provides for, it's a general provision that allows the court to apply other remedies. But 24.2 specifically refers to exclusion of evidence. So he's conducting a 24.2 analysis determining if he's wrong about the, the rights violations, should the evidence go in? I'll note that the courts typically, at a, the appeal level, don't put a whole lot of weight on this because it's really hard to conduct a proper 24-2 analysis to determine if the rights breaches were serious enough to leave evidence out if you didn't think there was a rights breach in the first place. But he goes through this anyway. Applying the factors in the Queen and Grant, which is a major case on 24-2 analysis, given our conclusions on the Section 8 and 9 issues, it is unnecessary to address this aspect of the appeal. Fair enough. If there's no rights violations, we don't need to ask if those rights violations lead to the exclusion of evidence. The appeal against conviction is dismissed. The appeal against sentence is dismissed as abandoned, because of course, if he's not pursuing it, then there's no reason to, uh, to consider it. As I said, this isn't a terribly legally interesting case in the sense that it's unlikely to be cited for any of its legal prospect or legal propositions. It's just kind of funny that this guy is going and trying to convince the police that his drugs were something else entirely. It is a bit of an interesting little tiny window, it's a very short case, into how these searches take place and the law around them. If people would like, I can go into more detail in future videos about search law, about uh, strip search law. Just let me know in the comments below. As always, please like, share, and subscribe if you've enjoyed this content. I've also got a link to both this case and to my Patreon below if you wish to help contribute. Thank you for watching, and I hope you've been armed with knowledge.